that? No, I haven't either. It'd be awesome. So good morning. How you guys doing? Good? All right. Well, you better get ready because I'm eight shots of espresso into this right now. So here we go. Put your seatbelts on. Acts 7 is where we're going to be. So turn your Bibles there. But before we get there, um, thank you for your prayers for the Rocky Point team leaving tomorrow. Uh, the Suarez family is the one we're doing the project for and with. Single mom, two college-age kids, two high school kids. She makes $400 a month. And, uh, but we get to go down and be a blessing and love on them. So pray for just some really, really good connections. We're taking teens down as well. So hopefully they all like have fun and hit it off and it's going to be a great, great time. So I look forward to sharing more with you about that. Um, I want to take a few minutes and talk about small groups here at Missio Day before we dive into the, uh, to the word. Um, so we have a little chart. I want to just kind of familiarize yourself, uh, get you familiar with this, what, what, what we do around Missio Day. Uh, we're simple. We like to think, keep things simple. We're not a complicated church. Um, we believe that small groups is the most important way to walk with God and walk with others. That the, the majority of what God is going to do in your lives is outside of this context. Which is weird for a pastor to preach that, right? Like to say, church is important, but it's not the most important thing. This is a jumping off point. This is a chance for us to come together together grow, learn, be encouraged, but we're going to eventually leave here. God has an hour and 15 minutes to work in our lives, and so many times we think that's all that he wants to do, but he wants to do so much more, and that's why small groups comes into the, uh, into the conversation. So this is our pathway to spiritual growth, and small groups are the primary ways we grow deeper with God and with each other. What does that look like? Glad you asked. So you'll see that it starts pretty broad at the top, narrows towards the bottom. So the most generic thing you can be involved in is the Sunday morning service, right? We gather to scatter. We gather to grow. We gather to be inspired. Um, we, we dive into the word. We sing. We pray, right? We give. We serve. But there's a next level that God wants to take you into because oftentimes the deep connections with God and with each other don't happen in this context, uh, we're all rushing to get out to lunch and get on with our lives and all the other stuff. So we've got to make time to, to grow with God and with others outside of this context. So one of the things we do next level is growth groups. Uh, Lori mentioned Questioner's Cafe. We do that at our house this summer uh, a couple times a month. We did one last Tuesday night. Who was there for Questioner's Cafe? So we talked about a whole lot of stuff. Marijuana, war, sex, stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff we talk about. Some of you are like, oh, I missed out on such a fun discussion, not all at the same time, not war and, and marijuana and sex all at the same, it was separate topics, just so you guys know. Uh, sometimes you need to clarify. And we had a special guest appearance, Chick-fil-A showed up, free Chick-fil-A for everybody. So some of you are like, oh darn it, I knew I should have went. Well, I can't guarantee you that next time. 21st of July, uh, June at our house, so Tuesday the 21st is going to be the next one. But again, we, we come together, we interact, we, we talk through scripture and, and, and truth and philosophy uh, but there's a different level, and that's the third level. Life groups or our small groups uh, uh, ministries. Take out your program that you, you got at the door. Uh, on this insert, on the back side, there's a current list of um, small groups that are either going on right now or they're about to start. And this is kind of what we're offering for the summer and for the fall. And, and our, our desire is that everyone would be in a small group environment. Most churches, if they have any semblance of success in small groups, they get about 25% of their people in small groups. That's what most churches deem as success. And I go, 25%? No, we're going for 100. So uh, if you see an unmarked white windowless van outside your house at night, that might be us creeping in on your lives saying, you need to get into a small group. So uh, I kid, but maybe not. So um, life groups. So there's this list here. So we've got groups for men, we've got groups for women, and we've got groups that are, that are co-ed and uh, th those are going to be great. So I just want to talk through these real quick. So we have women that are meeting. Is my wife still around or did she take off? Man, she's gone, man. This is like a cloud of dust. She's boom out of here. So she's leading a group on Thursdays in the morning and at night. So same group, same topic, but uh, they meet here. Carrie, what time are they meeting on Thursday mornings? Nine o'clock? You want to say anything about the group since you're, you're part of that? Um, you want to just stand up and I'm putting you on the spot now. So Carrie, give a hand for Carrie if you would. So Carrie is a part of the, the, uh, the group, uh, amazing photographer, FYI. Uh, but uh, tell us about the Thursday morning group. What are you guys talking about? Give us kind of the vibe, the feel. Um, 
I love it. I love it. So. Yeah. Which, if we realize, like, we don't need to complicate it any more than that, right? Just journeying together. Sometimes you're high, and sometimes everyone else is low, and sometimes others are high, and you're low, and... Um, and by high, I don't mean marijuana, all right? So just so we're clear, I don't already mentioned that, but, but it's awesome. Anne, you're part of that group too. Anything you would add to that? Anne, go ahead, stand up so we can know who you are. Um, you and Carrie are part of that group, 9 a.m. Thursdays. Anything else you'd add? Hmm. That's awesome. So uh, if you have availability Thursday mornings at 9, see Ann, see Carrie. They'd love to invite you to that. Thursday nights, my wife uh, will be facilitating that. Uh, same, same dynamic, same group uh, here at 7 o'clock. Um, and then we have a couple others. Uh, we have, uh, is Carol still around? So she was the one on the piano. She took off too. She meets with a group of women here at 9.30 on um, Wednesday mornings. And so they are, I think she said they're going to be going through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. So there's a couple options uh, for you. And then Michelle Kent, and I think she took off. So you guys are all at the hangover service. These people come because they, they come to the first service, right? Um, uh, Michelle, once a month, first Sunday of the month, after first service, they go to her house, and they hang out and eat lunch and talk. So uh, all their contact info is on here. So if you're uh, a, a woman and wants to get into a small group environment with other women, Great opportunity for you to do that. Now, for the guys, uh, we're not as bougie as the ladies are, but we do something, right? So I lead two groups. Mike Strawn leads a group. So his group is here at 6 a.m. on Wednesdays. So if you're interested in that, these guys talk through the message and go through, like, message notes. What did God share with you through the message on Sunday? Tuesday nights, we're putting this one on hold till August. We meet at the Hungry Monk Sports Bar, and we get to talk about uh, Jesus among drunk people. So this is a lot of fun. So if you're into that... And that's your scene. Um, Tuesdays, 8 o'clock, Hungry Monk. We won't pick that up until August. Uh, so some of you are part of that. And then Friday morning, 6 a.m., we're here. We just started Ecclesiastes. And so here's the bait uh, and switch on this. I offer you free coffee drinks. So if you come out, 6 a.m., I hook you up for free coffee. We go through Ecclesiastes together. Uh, David, I'm going to put you on the spot. You're part of the, the deep end, we call it, on Friday mornings. Anything? Stand up. Go ahead. And uh, this is David Kosan. Give him a hand if you would. So... Um, just sell, sell the Sunday, uh, the Friday morning men's group thing. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, connect with David. Monty's a part of that too. Monty, raise your hand. So you can talk. If you're a dude and you got 6 a.m. on Friday morning, we're done in an hour. At 7 o'clock, we're out of there. We realize we all got to get to work or do whatever. Uh, it is awesome. And what's amazing is we'll, we have a text. We'll read through a few verses. We'll throw out a question. And before you know it, an hour is done and guys have just talked and shared and it's awesome. And Great, great time. So my info's on there. Talk to Monty. Talk to David. Um, these guys can tell you more about it. And then we have some new groups forming um, that uh, different parts of town. The Pococks, so Monty and Cheryl, uh, they live just real close, a mile or two down Warner. They're going to be meeting. Monty, why don't you stand up and tell us more about your group, when, where, what? Monty, if he's not in bed by 8.30, he's crabby. You don't want to know Monty after that time. Yes. Love it. Monty and Cheryl are just super quality people, and uh, we don't like to say we don't have anything planned. We just call it organic. That's the word we use, organic. It's very organic, so um, that's starting up on Wednesdays. His contact info is there, so men, women invited to that. Uh, and then we have another one starting in South Chandler. What are your cross streets, Lavolsi's? 
Does God even live down in that region of the, okay, I'm, I'm, okay, electricity, do you have internet down there? Okay, good, good. Uh, Dave, Gina, stand up if you would. I've known Dave and Gina for a while, wonderful couple. They're opening up their home and going to be hosting a small group. Tell us when, where, what. Oh, you got time to plan for that. Ooh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. I love it. Awesome. Good to, good to have you guys be a part of that. And uh, I've known uh, Dave and Gina for 17, 16, 17 years. So uh, don't go golfing with David. He is guaranteed to break people's windows. Just p- I'm putting that out there. That's a story I'm going to share sometimes because it's awesome. I love it. Um, so David, uh, his contact info is here. They're starting in August. They realize summer people are traveling. But Wednesday nights is their house, especially if you're down in that part of the valley. Uh, take advantage of that. They're just awesome. And then uh, you'll notice, too, under the general groups there, we, uh, we do a young couples ministry as well. For young couples married less than five years or, or engaged, um, we meet with, my wife and I meet with them because we feel like we can be mentors and, uh, and, and almost like coaches and speak into their lives. So we have a, a group of young couples, probably about eight young couples that meet for that once a month. So if you're in that category, uh, text my wife. That's her, those are her digits right there. So plenty of ways for you to plug in. Um, and this is just kind of what we're able right now to offer for summer, for fall, that could change uh, as people kind of step up and want to l- help facilitate or open up their homes. So here's the thing, and this is my, my challenge to all of you. You make time for what's important to you. Uh, we're not the level of ministry that can offer 10 small groups every day of the week. Uh, we're not that, that, that high capacity. But what we are able to offer, I think, are really, really good, and you make time for what's important to you. So too many times I meet with people and think that the Sunday morning attending church is all there is. This is not all there is. This is barely scratching the surface of what God wants to do in your life. And so avail yourself to, to these men and women that are giving of their time, giving of their, their shown hospitality, and they just want to organically, beep, 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 buzzword, uh, grow in Christ and with one another. And and. When you get involved in a small group, you, you make friends for life, and you experience things that you never thought possible in the Christian journey. So can I, all people God said what? Amen? You, you know, those of you that have been in it. And then there's a different level we're not going to talk about. D- DNA groups are those really, really close, confidant, two other people uh, that are really, really speaking to your life. Oftentimes, the DNA groups come out of small group environments. So if you're looking for that level of depth and intimacy, usually the small group is the jumping off point for that. So uh, thank you guys. Give them a hand if you would, the small group leaders. And um, what are else you need to know? Uh, you can contact these people. If there's any questions, go ahead and fill out the bottom of this. Drop it in the mailbox on your way out. So super, super thankful for a, a, a church that really, really values the importance of small group ministry. So um, awesome. Acts 7, turn your Bibles there if you would. And um, this is going to be a, a, a fun uh, conversation uh, as we navigate Acts chapter 7. Uh, I r- heard the, the on the radio the other day, there's a new, you know, just when you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I need a new app to download on my phone. Well, I've got one for you. Uh, the, it's called Be Real App. If you haven't heard about it, it's a new social media app as if we need another social media app, right? The cool thing about Be Real, and they had an interview with some people about this app, is that the app, uh, if you download it, randomly throughout the day, it will pop up and say, you have to post something now. It is, it is not able to be liked. It is not able to be shared. You have a one-minute window to capture whatever is going on in your life at that moment. You cannot filter it. You cannot edit it. You cannot do anything to it. It is what it is. 
and young people are gravitating to this app like crazy. Why? Because they've seen other social media apps where, you know, there's these celebrities that are posting these things. There's all your friends that are posting things. Look how perfect my life is. Look how perfect my vacation is. Look how perfect my makeup is. Whatever. And there's this depression that is setting into our culture where people are exposed to all this social media and they're going, well, I'm not living that life and I'm not looking like that and I'm not doing stuff like that. And so young people want to get real and so they're flocking to this app where any given moment you could be on the, on the, on the toilet, you can be in your car, uh, wherever, and you have to post something and all of a sudden you do and you get it unfiltered with flaws and all. How many of you are interested in something like that? That sounds pretty intriguing, doesn't it? And I think to myself, well, you really don't need an app for that. This is called just living life with other people, right? This is called, this is what it should be, the church, right? Living this kind of life where we just realize that I want to be a part of a community that accepts me warts and all, right? That, that accepts me unfiltered, unedited, where I can be loved as I am. Because until you hit that level of connection with people, you really feel like you're not living as real as you, you, you ought to be re- living. So Acts 7 puts that into perspective for us. Acts 7 reminds us that, boy, in all of human history, uh, people are flawed people, right? Matter of fact, you can turn to your neighbor and tell that person that they're a flawed individual. Just do it with the grace of Jesus, if you would, all right? We're all flawed people. We all make mistakes. We all fall short of what God wants. And yet, this is the beauty of the gospel. Here's the gospel. With With as flawed and messed up as we are, There's one constant that has always happened in human history. God continues to pursue us with his love. Can you imagine that? Like, I know more about myself than you know about me, and I sit there and I'm I'm in constant amazement that God would love such a person as myself. And you know more about yourself than others you've let in to know, and yet to to be reminded that God is constantly aware of your life and still chooses to want to love you. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And so Acts 7 reminds us of this. So turn your Bibles there. We've got quite a task ahead of us. So uh, we're going to do our best to navigate 53 verses today. Now, I'm not going to read every single one, but I'm going to give you the overarching idea of, of what's happening here. Because in Acts 7 comes the longest sermon in the book of Acts from a guy that we've already met by the name of Stephen. Now, Stephen is super cool dude because he's a guy who in Acts 6 is chosen among 20,000 people to be a table waiter. And what I mean by that is that the, that the widows of, of the, the Jewish widows were not being taken care of as well as they should have been taken care of. The church appoints seven men, Stephen's one of them, to help take care of what could have been an administrative nightmare that led to disunity. But instead, Stephen volunteered to serve tables, and in his serving tables, he was known to be pretty competent with the things of God. Being a new believer, but yet growing up in a Jewish household, he was pretty knowledgeable of the things of God and began to debate people in the synagogues, telling them about Jesus. Well, they saw the debate about Jesus as a challenge to Moses and the importance of the temple, and the, and the religious leaders got a little bit ticked off at him, and so they arrest him. And now he's standing before the Supreme Court of Israel, and now he has to give a defense of of what he was doing. What is he up to? What sort of shenanigans are you doing, Stephen? Well, you look at chapter 7, verse 1. Notice the high priest says to Stephen, are these things so? Meaning there's allegations that are coming forward saying you're blaspheming God. You're blaspheming Moses, that you don't consider the law as important, and you're desecrating our temple that we see as the very presence and and existence of God. What do you say for yourself? At this point, Stephen knows he is not going to get out of this alive. So he takes advantage of this moment to connect with his audience. Because more than saving his life, he wants these men to know Jesus. And I'm going to say that it is so important to come to a place in our lives 
where we realize that your reputation is not worth defending. Matter of fact, your, your mere existence is not worth defending. The only thing worth defending is the gospel that you say has so transformed your life. Because one day, believe it or not, your name will, will not mean anything to anybody. And I know that's like pretty harsh coming right out and saying, oh, are you saying I'm not important? I'm saying you're not important. This is not about you. When it comes to history, it is his story, and whatever is important has to do with God being the central aspect of the story. Here's what you have to realize is that Stephen has come to a place where he realized his life is not his own. His life has been touched by the grace and kindness and mercy of God. He is standing before this very angry Supreme Court, and he is going to point them to Christ. And I will tell you that there's no more important mission God has for you and I. You think your kingdom is important? Your kingdom will rise and it will fall. Ecclesiastes, the very book that we're digging into on Friday mornings with the guys, here's the thing. What, is it, what does it mean to put your hands to, to work and to spend 40 years in a job that one day no one's even going to remember your name at that workplace? All your assets are going to be passed on to your children. They're not going to be thankful that you pass it on to them, and they're going to lose it anyways. And then the, the writer says, meaningless is everything. Vanity of vanities. Life is just a chasing after the wind. Like, how many of you feel this like this about life, right? I'm going to tell you what, the good news is you don't have to feel that way when you live with Christ being at the center. Because whatever is done for Christ is eternally significant. And so Stephen is asked the question, and his sermon is a response to their question. How, what do you say for yourself? Well, I'm just going to let you know that I'm not going to say anything about myself. I'm going to point us back to the God that you claim to know. And so for 53 verses, check this out, he's going to cover 2,000 years of Jewish history. What I'm going to attempt to do this morning is in about 30 minutes cover 53 verses and 2,000 years of Jewish history. And some of you are like, God can't perform miracles like that. And I say, you say, no way. I say Yahweh. So turn your Bibles. Here we go. He's going he's gonna to paint Israel's history with four broad brush strokes. Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and the kings, David and Solomon. And then he's going to wrap it up with a nice little bow at the end that is an indictment upon not only his hearers, this court, but actually an indictment upon us today. And so let's see what Stephen has to say to us this morning. And I love it because... Luke writes the book of Acts. He also wrote the Gospel of Luke. The book of Luke, in chapter 24, if you remember, ends with a very similar scenario. Two disciples are wa walking on the road to Emmaus, their hometown, and there's a visitor with them, walking with them. And that visitor, who they don't know is Jesus, in the post-resurrection appearance, details for them everything the Old Testament taught about Jesus. And they went to their house, they're eating some soup, you know, some matzo ball soup or whatever they're eating. And uh, all of a sudden, G they, they realize it's Jesus who's been explaining the Old Testament to them, but he disappears. Well, here's another instance of how important the Old Testament is. Two-thirds of your Bible is the Old Testament. 39 books of the 66 that we would claim as being God's infallible word given to us is part of our Bible, but yet we are oftentimes negligent of understanding the God of, of these, these 39 books, right? This God of history that Stephen feels is important to go back to. But oftentimes we've heard it kind of sold to us like the Old Testament God is a mean and vindictive and angry God. How many of you have ever heard that? Like sitting in a New Testament class or, you know, it's like I attended a, a, a seminar with Richard Dawkins. If you don't know who Richard Dawkins is, he's one of the new atheists. Um, been around for a while. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. You kind of know where he stands on God. At Gamage, I sat under a, a lecture with uh, Richard Dawkins, and this was one of his main jumping off points, is like, the, how can you trust this God who is vindictive and murderous? And, and I sit there and go, you know what, you can piecemeal the Old Testament and look at all these scenes that are really kind of hard to understand, and you scratch your head and go, why would God do that? But in totality, the message of the Old Testament is the same as the New Testament. Not that we worship two gods, one's an angry God and one's a gracious God, but there's one God, and here's the message of Scripture from the beginning to the end, Genesis to Revelation. 
God is a God who's going to rescue his people through Jesus. If you were to summarize the Bible, it is God's rescue plan to save his people through Jesus. Now, I know some of you are saying, but wait, Old Testament, I thought Jesus was New Testament. Well, you forget that Jesus is God. He's not bound by testaments. He's always existed. But what we do see is in the Old Testament, appearances of Christ and, and the pointing to a Messiah yet to come that saved the people of the Old Testament. How were the people in the Old Testament saved? They weren't saved through their works. They weren't saved through their religious observance. They weren't saved through the tent, the tabernacle, the temple. They were saved because they had a forward faith that looked forward to the Messiah yet to come. Jesus comes, the fulfillment of everything that the prophets and the law spoke to. He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He comes, dies on the cross, substitutionary death for the people that would believe in him, buried, risen again. And now, after the cross, people have a backward-looking faith and believe in what Christ has done. So before the cross, it was a forward-looking faith. After the cross, it's a backward-looking faith. I think I'm about ready to bust an aneurysm right now. Okay, do you guys track what I'm saying? So everyone is saved the same way. This is why Old Testament believers, I believe, required more faith because they yet had to understand things that were still unseen. Where we who are after the cross have this backward-looking faith through history and look at what Christ has already done. Everything in the New Old Testament points to what the Messiah will do. Everything in the New Testament points back to what Messiah has done. In total, it is a plan of God to rescue his people through Christ. Which means you don't have to obey the law. You don't have to worship God in the temple. You don't have to circumcise your kids. You don't have to go be baptized. You don't have to take communion. All those things are maybe well and good, but they don't save you. What saves you is belief. Matter of fact, write that word down in your notes. Belief. Because this is the very thing the Supreme Court of Israel did not do. They substituted ritual for reality. They substituted, right, fundamentals with faith. They embrace dead tradition instead of living truth. So four points, and I'm just going to do an overview real quick, and you're going to see what Stephen does here so phenomenally. This guy's a young believer. Remember, Jesus crucified, buried, risen again. It's probably two, three months old in, in, the, in the reads. This is fresh stuff, right? And then Stephen comes along, who's a Jewish uh, young man who's grown up in a Jewish household, comes to know Jesus, and now he articulates 2,000 years of Jewish history, pointing these guys to the Messiah. What awesome courage. What awesome boldness. What awesome wisdom. Amazing what God does when you yield and surrender yourself to be used by him, whatever the context is. First point is this. It starts with Abraham. So in verses 2 through 8, he talks about Abraham. And you guys all know about Father Abraham, the father for great, three great faiths in the world, right? There's Judaism, there's Christianity, there's, there's Islam. Judaism doesn't admit that Christ was the Messiah, so they fall short of what God wants. Islam creates their own deity, a non-Trinitarian deity, who says, well, Jesus was a prophet, but the ultimate prophet is, uh, is Muhammad, and you've got to follow all the, the rigidity of Islam to be saved. So we count that one out because it's a salvation by works, not faith. So Christianity is the only true lone race your faith that stands, that reflects the Old and New Testament, and it starts with Abraham. Now look what it says in verse 2. It says, and God said, he calls out and appears to Father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia uh, before he lived in Haran. So God picked this dude in this total pagan culture in the middle of nowhere and says, I'm going to use you and through you bless the world. What does that mean? It means three things. Write these things down in your notes. God said to Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, I'm going to bless the world through you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a seed, and I'm going to make you a blessing. These were the three promises to Abraham. Here's the good news, ladies and gentlemen. No promise of God made to Abraham is yet to be fulfilled. They've all been fulfilled. 
This is why we as evangelicals need to, to, to focus less on what's going on in Israel and more on focusing on the gospel that's going to save Jew and Gentile alike. There are so many people that talk about, well, the land promised to Abraham is, hasn't been given to Abraham. We're, we need to get back the Temple Mount. We need to get back the Holy Lands and give it back to the people. And I sit there and go, well, where do you read this? Because in Joshua chapter 24, write that down. It says all the land promised to Abraham was given to Abraham. Period. But they lost it because of disobedience. This is why a guy like Abraham, who, Stephen says, never got a square foot of the land promised to him. See, what God didn't promise Abraham was a possession of it, but what he did give Abraham was a promise. And this is what the great account of Abraham teaches us, is that when you have a God who makes promises, his promises are worth banking on. And the writer of Hebrews, chapter 11, write it down, look at it later, says, you know what Abraham wasn't concerned about? He wasn't concerned about getting a square foot of land at Canaan. Because his builder and architect was God who was preparing the eternal land for him. Now stop right there. What has God promised us? We have to be careful because so many times our faith is sabotaged. So many times our faith is wrecked because we think God has promised us things when he hasn't really promised us those things. Can I, can I get, what, what do we think God has promised us and we've banked so much that this is what God's will is and we've been perhaps wrecked in our faith because of it? Just go ahead and shout something out. Health. health. God has never promised you health. Happiness. What else? Security. What else? Love. Oh, good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's promised us love. I was going to be like, whoa, Hannah, come on now. A good job. Right. What else? An easy life. So you see, the things that we've mentioned are the things that we are so susceptible in buying into. And God has not promised us health. He has not promised us happiness. He has not promised us a, a good job or a, a wife or a husband or children, right? Here's what God has promised us. Whatever your soul is hungry for, that soul has been designed to be fulfilled in Christ and Christ alone. He is our yes and amen, Christ is. He's the promise. And whatever we may be doing without on this side of eternity, God is going to more than make up for in eternity when you spend eternity with him. So we have to be careful. When we read famous authors or listen to pastors and, and you know, what they're promising, they, they oftentimes with good intentions, people give us false hope. And I'm going to tell you this morning that the promise that Abraham banked on is the same promise I want to bank on in my life. And it starts with believing. He, Romans chapter 4, verse 3, write it down. It was, it was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness, what? Belief. The only way you get in good with God is surrendering your life and believing in him who has come to make himself known to you. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to communion. All those things I already mentioned, that's all ritual observance, and that's okay. But the main thing that God wants is he doesn't want your religious, uh, religious observance. He wants your heart. Here's the promise. If you believe, it will be credited to you as righteousness. That is really bugging me, isn't it? Bugging you? Yeah, we're going to just ignore it. So. so God has promised you righteousness because of belief, not because you can generate a righteousness. Abraham believed and was reckoned to him as righteousness. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. But God said, I'm going to bless the world through you. He gave him a land, his ancestors a land. He gave him a son. He waited a long time for this little boy. And it's through this lineage that the ultimate blessing came, and his name is Jesus. And now all the promises are yes and amen in Christ. Can I just, I'm going to encourage you guys. The more you dig into God's promises, the more you're going to experience His presence, which is what your souls hunger for. What, what, would, it, what would it be if God gave us great health and didn't give Him Himself? 
What if God gave you a great job, but he didn't give you himself? See, God wants us to understand that I know my heart. It's pretty fickle. I would, I would, I would adore and idolatrize the, uh, the gift rather than the giver of the gift. And here's what God says. You press into me, and here's what I'm going to promise you, my presence. And that's what he says, even in the, in the verse, uh, verse 8, if you look down, it says, and so God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a tangible sign that you're mine. And it's called circumcision. Now, being, now, imagine being Abraham, the recipient of this message, right? Like, as grown men adults, we got to go get, go get circumcised. What if I came to the church and said, all right, guys, God came to me, gave me a vision. We got to go get circumcised. How many guys are going, sweet? No, we're not. So he goes back to the camp, and he tells everybody, we got to go get circumcised because this is the way we're going to be set apart from all the other people. But again, even though they were a circumcised people physically, many of them were an uncircumcised people spiritually. Because here's the key with the promise. The promise is not God will save you because you've gone through some physical circumcision. The promise is this, has God circumcised your heart? Write down Romans chapter 2, verses 28-29. You are Abraham's offspring. Not if you've gone through the circumcision of the flesh, but if you've had the circumcision of the heart. This is what the Apostle Paul argues, right? Here's the Hebrew of Hebrews, Jew of Jews, right? This is the guy who has had an education in Jewish tradition like none other, and he comes right out of the gate and says, don't you call yourself a child of Abraham because of your ritual observance. What God wants is a changed heart. And that comes through belief. Point number two, Joseph. So then verse nine, he says, let me tell you about Joseph. What do we know about Joseph other than what Andrew Lloyd Webber put together in the amazing Technicolor dream code? How many of you saw that? Right? We know that the father played a little bit of favoritism, right? Gave his youngest son this coat. The other brothers were jealous, right? And what did they do? They, mur- they set out to murder the brother. Let me just tell you, if you have siblings you, get along- you don't get along with, murder is not an option. Can I get an amen? Sometimes i got to put those things out there. I don't know what you're thinking, all right? You know, COVID's done a lot of crazy things in our world, all right? So, so you don't murder your sibling, amen. Okay, so instead of murdering the brother, they say, wait, we can actually turn this into an entrepreneurial thing. We'll sell them into slavery. Let me tell you, side note, if you don't feel like murdering your sibling but want to sell them into slavery, not a good idea, all right? If you need money, hit me up. I, I can hook you up. I'll introduce you to Michael Grasso. Okay, so other than that, uh, so they sell him into slavery. The brother, Joseph, ends up where? In Egypt. Now, here's the thing that's remarkable about Joseph. Getting the people of God to Egypt has always been God's plan. He tells us in, in the Abraham sequence. So all of a sudden, when you think like the brothers have the upper hand, it's actually God's providence working all along. Joseph is an account that tells us about God's providence. Joseph goes to Egypt, and not all is like, you know, a a, a pathway of of bed, you know, roses, and it's not all good. Like, he was accused of rape, right? He was uh, left to die in a prison, forgotten by the cupbearer and the bread maker, right? But eventually, through all this transition and trials and tribulations, he rises and becomes the second most powerful man in the land. And God uses Joseph's position to bring his family out of famine to Egypt where they have stored up grain. And if you remember the scene, so even though the brothers meant evil for Joseph, Joseph sees his family come to him and he recognizes his family coming for help. They don't recognize him. He says, go back and, and bring, bring your father back and, and let's make sure your family's taken care of. And then that second ba- coming back, he reveals himself to them and they all are, they're all like in awe that the brother's still alive. But he shows them grace. And forgives them and says in chapter 50 of Genesis the most amazing phrase perhaps uttered in the, in the Old Testament. This scene always gets me so, so broken up. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. That's providence, ladies and gentlemen. Joseph was rejected by his family and then ultimately accepted to be saved from the famine. 
Does that sound like another character from Scripture to you? Jesus being re the rejected one, ultimately then being accepted by those who would be saved. See, there's a reason why Stephen is going down this Old Testament path. He wants you to see that the ways of God have been consistent throughout all of history. There are people that reject him, but he still seeks after them. So Joseph is this wonderful account of being rejected by the family, rising to the, the place of authority, becoming a deliverer for his family, all because God is the greatest behind-the-scenes actor ever. Can I just have you stop right now and just think about your own life and, and remind you that what may not make sense to you is in complete control under the hands of God. That you're looking at your relationships, you're looking at your job situation, you're considering your health. I don't know what is, what is it that's on your mind and on your heart right now, but the moment you think that life is out of control is the very moment you need to press in and hear God say, your life is in my control. And the, and the mindset that you need to adopt, which is the mindset of Joseph, because here's the one thing about Joseph that's really, really interesting. You really don't hear of anything bad that he did. He honored God. Write down that word, honor. Phrase, honor God. No matter what you may be going through, through the best course of action is to always honor God. Because 1 Samuel chapter 2 says this, He who honors me, I will honor. And this is the beauty of God's providence. He's always acting. He's always doing something behind the scenes. And he's bringing about your guaranteed future, whether you realize it or not. He's always aiming for an eternal destiny for you to be with him forever. Now, what that course looks like, we don't know. How many of you are like, I don't want this course that God has me on. But God says, I have you on the course for a reason. Because ultimately, you're going to be in glory with me forever. There's the destination. You may not like the journey, but praise God, you have a God who's faithful to carry you through to the end. And all God's people said. And then there's Moses. So verse 17, he goes into the longest section in his sermon on Moses. Why? Because it's Moses that he was allegedly accused of blaspheming. And he says, I don't want you to think I'm blaspheming Moses whatsoever. Actually, I really appreciate Moses. And he talks about Moses in three stages. So go ahead and write down one, two, three. He talks about stage uh, uh, age uh, zero through 40 in Moses' life when he was an Egyptian. 40 through 80 years of age when he was in Midian. He, got, he gets married, has kids. God appears to him in the burning bush. And then there's 80 through 120, roughly, that he goes and he delivers Israel out of captivity from Egypt. All a message of a reminder of God's patience. Or, I'm giving you an option here. Ooh, don't you like options? Protection. Write down the word patience and or protection. Because, again, 400 years Israel's been in Egyptian captivity. God has promised to deliver them. Even in delivering him, them, God has shown not only his hand of protection over Israel, but he's also shown his patience that even when he delivers them, they're still complaining at him in the wilderness. Not that anyone's ever complained to God here. I'm just saying, you know, hypothetically, what if we were to complain to God? Here's the thing you need to understand, Moses. Raised in an Egyptian household, learns the language learns the religion, learns mathematics, reads all the famous Egyptian literature. He is Egyptian through and through, even though that's not his heritage. He's, he knows he's different. He knows he's picked to be a deliverer. And he sees an opportunity in an instance in his life where he sees an Egyptian beat up a Hebrew, steps in, breaks up the fight, ends up killing the Egyptian thinking this is his moment of rescue. And he says to the people, I'm your deliverer. And they say, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? Not a great reception. Rejected as God's deliverer. 
but he falls flat on his face. Why? Because he acted on his own impulse and didn't trust in the timeline of God. He self-exiles himself to Midian, gets married, has kids. 80 years of old, God shows up to him in a burning bush and says, now let me take the initiative and say, now is the time for deliverance. Can I just tell you right now, the moment you assert yourself and think you're ready to do something from God without him first initiating, you're going to end up in a disaster. Like Moses. He is an 80-year-old failure who now has an opportunity to serve God faithfully. If there's any 80-year-olds in this room right now, your life is not done yet. Any 80-year-olds? Okay, I didn't think so. 70-year-olds. All right, no, 60 year Here's the good news. No matter what you may have attempted for God and failed at, it is never too late for him to take the initiative and do something new in you and through you for his glory. Amen? God never puts his people out to pasture. Whether you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, heck, even 100-year-olds. We're out there serving Jesus, right? Here we go. So Moses meets God in the burning bush. Moses says, who shall I say sends me? God says, tell him I am sent you. He goes in, rescues the people, leads them out of captivity, through the Red Sea, 40 years of wilderness wanderings. What do the people do? Moses, you're the best. Isn't this great? No, no, they bicker and complain. God doesn't give us meat. God doesn't give us water. God doesn't give us a good leader. Talk about being rejected a second time. So much so, look at verse 39, Acts 7. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. You know what they said? Moses, we're rejecting you. God, we're rejecting you. We want to go back and live under a state of bondage under false gods. Can I, can I just tell you something right now? If we don't train people up properly to trust the one true God, even in difficulties, people return to gods that don't have their best in, in their minds. That's why Hebrews chapter 6 says, once people have been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift, they've eaten the the bread falling down from heaven, they taste the water from the rock, and if they are disappointed with God, they return to their false gods, their empty gods, their meaningless gods, and it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Can you imagine being a leader? A God-appointed leader? And the people saying, yeah, we don't want you and we don't want your God anymore. We're going back to our old ways. How your heart would break. And yet Moses persevered. And Moses predicts there's one coming who's going to be the ultimate deliverer, one like me, who's rejected but needs to be accepted, and his name is Jesus. So what's what's the, the story up to this point? Abraham, chosen by God. Joseph, chosen by God, rejected, but then ultimately accepted, right? Moses, rejected by the people, and then accepted, and then rejected again. Like, here is Old Testament history in a, in a, in a nutshell. People continuing to reject God, and yet he still pursues them. Then we come to the kings. Look at verse 45. Kings meaning David and Solomon. Look what it says in Acts 7, verse 45, 46. David found favor in God's sight, asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. David stepped up and said, I want to build a a temple for you. Here's the problem. David initiated. God didn't. God says to David, you're not going to build a temple for me, but I'm going to allow your son to do it for me. So Solomon, verse 46, builds a house for God. However, the Most High, he says, and he quotes right, ex, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says, and then he quotes Isaiah 66. The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. 
What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things that you're using as building supplies to make a temple for me? So here's what the kings teach us. That God is not present in things made by your hands. Remember Abraham? He was called in the Mesopotamian wilderness. Remember Joseph? He was wor- God worked through him in a place called Egypt. You remember Moses? God worked through him in Egypt and in the wilderness wanderings. Here's what you need to know, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the good news. God oftentimes wants you to be aware of his presence in probably the least holy of places. Here's what we think. I'm going to church on Sunday at 1045 at Sozo. That's where God is. And then at, 10, at 12 o'clock, 12.15, whenever Pastor Scott, Scott gets done yammering, right, we leave and then we go about our business and then we look forward to meeting God again. And here's what God wants you to know throughout Old Testament history and even to today. God's presence is everywhere that you go to. You live in. You work in, you go get it. God is in your house. God is in your work. God is in your neighborhood. God's in your circle K. God's in your gym. God's at at, at Lake Pleasant. God is wherever you are, that's where God is. And if you relegate God to a location, he no longer becomes the pilgrim God who's desiring to make his presence known no matter where you may be. Oftentimes those wilderness moments when you need him the most. What are you thinking that you're going to make a house for me? God does not contain in buildings made by your hands. God is everywhere all the time. And what a refreshing note for us. To remember that no matter where I may be, God is always present. Psalm 139, if I go to the highest heights of heaven, you are there. If I go to the depths of Sheol, behold, you are there. This is great comfort for the psalmist who says, wherever I go, good or bad, good or evil, you are there with me. And that's why you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death because you know your shepherd leads you through those dark moments. What do you think in relegating God to this this occasion? This is the problem when we compartmentalize our faith and think God only exists at one place at one moment during one time a week. Are you freaking kidding me? He's with you when you rise up. He's with you when you lie down. He's with you with everything in between, and he's even present when you slumber and you have no idea that he's sustaining your very life. God is there. And there's an interesting note I need to shed with you on this. As Stephen quotes Isaiah 66, and I hope you look at it later, he leaves off the second half of verse 2. Because verse 2 finishes in, in Isaiah 66 with these words, it is only the humble and broken that realize this ever-present God that I'm speaking of. Humble and broken. Which then leads us to our last point, and this is for us. While God is a God who has left a pattern for us to follow his activity, you will never ever figure God out completely. He is a God of mystery. What he has revealed is good for us, amen? But what he hasn't disclosed to us is also good for us. And here's what he says to us. We need to remember that our God is a God who pursues us even today. God pursued Abraham. God pursued Joseph. God pursued Moses. God pursued the kings. He's pursued the prophets. He's pursued the disciples. He's pursued people throughout history. He is a God who is relentless in pursuing those on whom he is going to place his affection. 
And if you continue to try to live life apart from him, he's still going to pursue you. But the pursuit will come to an end. Either with you accepting or with you eternally rejecting. This is why Stephen turns the table of indictment on his his accusers. Look at verse 51. You men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised. Now I'm going to tell you right now, this may not be the best way to engage an audience. Obviously, he didn't read Del Del Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. But he's very deliberate on the words he uses. Stiff-necked and uncircumcised. Of course, uncircumcised goes right to the very Abrahamic covenant. To call them uncircumcised is to be like, you're not children of Abraham, which would be an offense, right? But also, when he says them a stiff neck, stiff neck is a phrase they would be familiar with because it's those who are unbelievers that are stiff necked and reject God. He's saying to this audience, you say you know God, but you don't. You've relegated God to following the law to worshiping God in the temple. You have a religion. You embrace ritual, but you're denying the present reality of something vibrant, and that is relationship. This is not about ritual. This is about relationship. And so he says, you stiff neck, uncircumcised in heart, ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just like your fathers did. And then there's the stick in the knife a little bit deeper. Look at verse 52. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not kill? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who receive the law as ordained by angels, yet did not keep it. Harsh truth. but it's even a harsher ultimate reality. These men have a decision. Do we accept the message or do we reject the message? Well, if history (laughs) tells us anything, they are part of a culture that continues to reject, reject, reject. Anytime your heart rejects truth, you will seek after some alternate truth. Your life has been designed to worship. The question is not what are you worshiping, who are you worshiping? George Orwell. My daughter's reading Animal Farm. How many of you were forced to read Animal Farm in school? How about 1984, right? This is a guy who wrote... Oftentimes these guys, you know, Orwell, Huxley, they're like prophets in a sense, like, wow, they could see things coming that Orwell says this. this now, Orwell's not a believer. He said this. I got to read this quote to you. When men stop worshiping God, they promptly start worshiping man with disastrous results. If you reject the one true God you will promptly start worshiping some sort of God with disastrous results. History has proven this time and time again. Our hearts are idol-making factories. And I need to tell you this morning that once you set the wisdom of Scripture aside, you will start to seek after wisdom from a human source that is ultimately disastrous for your soul. My wife is watching a show, binging a show on cult leaders. Now, I don't know if I should be concerned about my wife. Either she's watching cult leader shows or she's watching uh, serial killer shows. And she loves this. Kind of, anyone else out there like that? All right, so I walk in. I'm like, what are you watching? She's like, oh, another show on Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm like, this is a little weird, right? All right, so, so my wife's watching this show on this cult leader. And she says to me, you got to watch this scene. So she goes, this woman who's this cult leader basically is telling this group of followers, and she's got thousands of followers. 
I have yet to find someone with higher wisdom than me, so therefore I am wisdom in your life. And this guy chimes in the group, right? And I feel so sorry for this guy, but I like him, right? He chimes in and says, well, who are you accountable to? And she looks at him and says, there is no one above me. You do what I tell you to do. Essentially, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying this. She looks this guy, I am the highest authority that there is in this world. You do what I tell you, and if you don't like it, you can leave. And if you know anything about this woman, she's got issues. I mean, obviously, right there in that scene, right? right? But um, men and women flock to people like this, thinking they're going to arrive and get everything that they've ever been dreamed of, dreamed of or, or promised, and in the end, they're left with a disaster. And yet God comes on the scene and doesn't use tactics of manipulation, doesn't use tactics of abuse, doesn't use tactics of power control, but he humbles himself and he serves you and says to us, you're soul thirsty? Come drink from the water that never ends. Is your whole soul hungry? Well, there's bread that's dropped out from heaven, and when you eat it, you've never tasted anything like it, and it comes to you without end. And if you're hopeless, come know the one who has designed you for hope, and that all your hopes can be found and realized in me. Joy and love, and grace, and mercy. Aren't we, aren't we all like the woman at the well who lived with such guilt and such, such shame and, and encountered Jesus, and he says to us, I know everything about your life, and even more. And then we change the subject on him. How many of you have ever changed the subject on God when he's starting to really poke at those sensitive areas? Hey, let's talk about where we should worship. Should we worship on that mountain or that mountain? And Jesus says, it's not about where you worship. It's about who and why you worship. He breaks through to this woman's heart and says to her, stop talking about religion. Stop talking about empty ritual." And come to me who offers life without end. Life that never disappoints. Those who worship me will worship me in spirit and in truth. That's what God says. And here is a woman who is converted and runs back to her village, announcing at the top of her lungs that she's found someone who knows everything about her and has shown her grace and has changed her. Doesn't sound stiff-necked and uncircumcised to me. Today, God is pursuing similar individuals. It might be you. The danger is closing your ears and resisting what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you. The danger is taking this which has been given to us by angels, that's what Stephen says, and, and rejecting it. This, this is a privilege. And yet many of us have this but don't submit to it. Don't listen to it. Don't honor it. Don't obey it. You realize judgment begins with the house of God. Those of us who should know better, and we don the, the Christian facade, and we do our Christianese language, we live our Christian life, go to church, right? Send our kids to Christian school, have big, big Christian study Bibles. And God says, but you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. The best news I have for you today is this. God's pursuit of you. Stop being religious. 
and surrender in relationship to Christ. You're lost. It's time to be found in all of your ugliness and warts and all. Amen? Be real. Right? You're, you're blind. You're, you're pretending like you see, but everyone knows you're groping about in darkness. The light has come. Grace has been revealed. Stop playing games with trying to obey the law and go to church. God does not exist in buildings made by hands. He is now existing in the true temple, and that's called your life. Come and know that he is Lord. Taste and see that he is good. Stop running and surrender. The church needs to hear this. We think this message is for those out there. It is. But there are so many people living with a false sense of security. Are you loving the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? and that is purely fueled because of relationship with him, you're good. But if you keep trying to substitute in works and all this other stuff that ruins the relationship, you got to get back on the right track. Peter, asked by Jesus, all the crowds begin to walk away from Christ, and Jesus says to the disciples, are you guys going to walk away from me too? And Peter goes, where else are we to go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. That's where we need to be. Jesus says, yeah, you, you follow the law of Moses and you worship in the temple, but you haven't come to me. I'm the one that offers you life. That's where we need to be. I'll close with this. Leon, three-year-old Iditarod sled dog. You guys hear about Leon in March? Ran away. They're on the track at the starting line, right? The Iditarod dog runs away. Imagine being the, the, the Iditarod guy, right? You're going like, there goes one of my dogs. Leon, three years old, runs away in March. They spend all this money, helicopters, snowmobiles, trying to find him, raise thousands of dollars for the campaign, Operation Find Leon. No luck until Leon turns up three months later, 150 miles away. Skinny, but still alive. And they bring him back, back to the owner. Now, I can't imagine what the conversations are like, right, back at the... But here's this dog, for some reason, thought, I'm better off out there. Gets found. Gets rescued. Reunited with his owner. Thousands of dollars spent to rescue a three-year-old Iditarod sled dog. I can't help but think about the fact that the price God paid to rescue you is far greater than we can ever imagine. He sends his only son to die for us. Because he says, Operation Fine Hannah is the most important mission right now. Operation Fine Ezra is the most important mission right now. The Operation Fine Tristan is important right now. And I will spend the most extreme amount of sending my son so that you will know you're loved. Yeah, you were lost, but now you're found. That's, that's the story of Scott. I was once blind, but now I see. That's the story of me. And there's not a day that goes by that I'm not grateful. I'm not saying there's not a day that goes by where I'm not an obstinate jerk sometimes. But there's not a day that goes by that I'm not overwhelmed by his grace. He shows his love towards us that while we're yet sinners, Christ dies for us. That's pursuing love right there. I hope you know the God that Stephen has preached about that I'm sharing with you because this is the God who wants to spend eternity with you. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand up, let's pray. What is it, five o'clock at night? Boy, we've gone on forever, just kidding. <laughs> Father, thank you for the message of Stephen that reminds us that you're a God who has been interacting with people just like us from, from, from thousands of years ago. 
Nothing changes with your character. Nothing changes with your approach with us. The God who pursued Adam in the cool of the garden to restore relationship is the same God who pursues our hearts today and says, I want you. I forgive you. And I want to call you my child and spend eternity with you. May we not resist your voice. But may we surrender and find life, find hope, and find relationship for which we are wired for with you. Thank you for your patience, Father. Thank you for your, your grace that you extend to us. Thank you for the fact that even today you pursue people who don't want you, who reject you. May, may those who are, are wandering today be found. May today be the day of salvation. Thank you for the gathering of your people, for the ways you're working in our lives. May you be glorified forever, and may Christ be exalted continuously. We pray this in our mighty deliverer's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Connect with a small group leader if you haven't yet, and have a wonderful day. See you soon.